Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Cerebral Policy Seminar. Today's a special day because it's actually National Cerebral Policy Day. We want to take this time to do our extra special webinar. Today, we're going to talk about um, cerebral palsy, the experimental function changes in pain as we all grow older. Um, I know we all struggle with cerebral palsy. I'm by self all the time. So this is way to the educated about cerebral palsy. Today I'm going to start by handing it to Dr. Mary Dante. And welcome. Thank you. Should we begin? Yes, go ahead. Okay. I'm going to share my screen and then Jody's going to start us off. Mm -hmm. So let it, let me see how talented I am to do that. And take it away, Jody. Hello, everyone. My name is Jody Kreshmer. I'm going to be wearing many hats today. I am a person with cerebral palsy. I also work with Dr. Edward Herbert in his clinic um, at the University of Michigan's Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation as a research associate. Um, I've been doing that for about 10 years now. Um, and I am also a board member of my CP. So I have many hats today to share my perspective. Um, as Paul said, um, Dr. Mary Gennady is also going to be part of this presentation, and Dr. Hurwitz, um, Shannon Boldy, my colleague, who's also a research associate, also contributed to this work. So today we are going to be talking about um, function changes when you get older as, adult, as an adult with cerebral palsy and what we can help do to help you manage pain, um, why you have those function issues, et cetera, et cetera. All these questions that I and my friends usually ask, I wanted to be able to help everyone get the information. So today Oops, we're sorry. going to be talking about different type of questions, such as why we have functional decline, where the pain stems from, uh, Mary, you can go to the question slide, I'm sorry. Um, why does it matter what type of pain you have and how you can best manage it? And we're going to start it off today with Dr. Hurwitz talking about how your abilities may change as you grow older with cerebral palsy. Thank you, Jody. Um, let's go to my first slide, please. So we wanna talk about why people with cerebral palsy uh, have pain and particularly why they have more pain than we see in people who don't have cerebral palsy. So the good news is, is that uh, people with cerebral palsy are, are having an expanding lifespan. Uh, people that are what we, what we call high functioning in their mobility, what we call the gross motor functional classification scale uh, one and two, uh, have excellent survival. Uh, that about 98% will have a regular lifespan. For the folks who are like less mobile, like GMFCS four and five using wheelchairs, the survival is on the rise with an increasing average lifespan. There's over 500,000 adults with cerebral palsy in the United States. Now, all of us get pain issues and functional issues as we get older. The problem is that we're talking about is the people with cerebral palsy tend to have more of it and much younger. Now, why is that? Next slide, please. Well, we have to think about the developing body 
when a child, an infant, with, with, has a condition which causes cerebral palsy, we know it's a, an issue with the brain, but we also know that it really affects every system of the body. For example, bones are not formed normally. Uh, people with cerebral palsy either don't put enough weight on their bones because they don't stand as much as other people, or their muscles are pulling in abnormal ways, which affects the bones. But however it is, the bone structure is not normal or compared to other people. Same with the muscles. There's been some great work done with uh, muscles in cerebral palsy and other spastic conditions from childhood, which show that the muscles don't work the way they do in people who don't have cerebral palsy, that the cells that make muscles are, are uh, less there, that the components of the muscles uh, function differently. Um, all that, starting from the problem, there's a brain, but it affects the muscle. And when the muscles and the bones are affected, you're going to have problems with the joints. Joints are going to become tight. Joints are going to be uh, malformed or, or pulled out of place as you get older. So all of these things will contribute to the, what we're going to talk about now as to reasons why people with cerebral palsy have pain and functional loss. Next slide, please. So there's several things that we need to understand to understand where the pain is coming from. One is that people with cerebral palsy tend to have a low level of fitness and tend to have a high level of obesity. In our picture here uh, on the uh, left, the picture of the graph is a, is a study that we did on uh, obesity. And we see that the people who have uh, a body percentile, body mass percentile of 91 and higher, that there's a big spike there showing that people with cerebral palsy, this children with cerebral palsy have uh, a, more, a lot of obesity. And uh, that just tends to go forward when they're adults. And the picture on the right, the picture of the muscle, we see on the top row, a person with cerebral palsy compared to a same age person who does not have cerebral palsy. You see all the white areas, which are fat, and the dark areas are muscle. And we see that the person with cerebral palsy will have more fat and much less muscle, meaning that their muscles are less efficient. Their muscles don't work as well, and that will affect everything about their body. Next slide, please. So there'll be problems with painful joints. Some of that will have to do with the muscles, some with the bones, and a lot with the neurologic problem of spasticity. Uh, the hips are often pulled out of place. And with that, in the children, the hip joints don't form correctly, which leads to severe arthritis, causing a lot of pain in adulthood. Um, the uh, use of assistive devices can cause pain in the joints, in the arms, because the arms aren't really meant to hold weight up but people with cerebral palsy will often use their arms to support themselves while they're walking and they really put most of their weight on their arms. And the arms just weren't made for that. And then the joints will uh, have contractures. That's because people with cerebral palsy have bones that grow faster than their muscles. We talked about the muscles being formed uh, differently than people who don't have cerebral palsy. And one of the things that happens is, is that they just don't grow as well. So as the bones grow and the muscles grow less, muscles grow slower, the joints tend to become contracted, which can lead to painful conditions. Next slide, please. All of the things we're talking about, the muscles, the bones, the spasticity, the way the joints are, will affect walking. So for example, uh, people with cerebral palsy often have tight hamstrings, and that leads to strain on the back. That picture on the far right, which shows uh, the uh, person with the, the spine showing, shows that curve in the back. That curve in the back is something I commonly see in my patients, and that it contributes to the back pain they have. And a lot of it has to do with weakness in the muscles in the core and the trunk and tight hamstrings. And then the spasticity and the contractures we talk about change the walking patterns. And that will just lead to the body getting stresses that it's really not designed for, and that will lead to pain and functional loss. Next slide, please. We talked about spasticity. Many of you understand the fact that people with cerebral palsy have spasticity. You experience it yourselves. What happens to spasticity as people uh, age into adulthood? Well, there's some debate about that, whether it gets better or worse or stays the same. But the truth is for many patients, spasticity does increase, not for everybody, which leads to additional changes in the way they walk, their gait, and more stress on the joints. And then there's neurologic causes of spasticity. People with cerebral palsy are more prone to have spinal stenosis, 
which means tightening of, of the bones in the spine around the spinal cord and around the nerves, which is very painful. Also, uh, and, and can cause spasticity. Also, people with cerebral palsy are, are more prone to have strokes, and sometimes we don't even know it because it affects the part of their brain that's already affected by cerebral palsy, and they get more spastic, and we think it's their cerebral palsy, but it was really a stroke. So all of the, those things can cause increased spasticity. Then the muscles have gotten tight, there's less stretching, often less stretching when people are adults, and there's less treatment. Uh, people with cerebral palsy, children with cerebral palsy get therapy in school, uh, as adults grow up and they get busy, um, a lot of times the therapy and the stretching go by the wayside, which increases the effects of spasticity and therefore increases pain. Next slide, please. People with cerebral palsy who walk fall quite a bit, and that leads to fractures. We talked about the bones being not normally formed. I see a lot of arm fractures from people who fall and try and catch themselves. Fractures contribute to pain. People with cerebral palsy have more fractures than people who don't. In the graphs that you see in front of them, you see the graph for the female. The dark line is people with cerebral palsy. And you see that people with cerebral palsy, females with cerebral palsy, have more fractures than females who don't have cerebral palsy, the light line below, all the way through the lifespan. Which really, what really surprised us is that males with cerebral palsy, they're on the right, that dark line, they kind of look like the females with cerebral palsy, even though they don't have the hormonal changes, which tend to increase fractures in women. Um, they have a lot more fractures than their, uh, their typically developing peers. So these fractures will lead to pain. They'll lead to people being uh, afraid to move around if they, because they, came, they had a fracture and they're afraid to fall again. And lack of movement will lead to less fitness and will lead to more pain. Next slide, please. The nerves can be pinched in cerebral palsy. We talked about the spinal stenosis. We talked about the, that impact in the spinal cord, which causes spasticity. It can also cause pinching of the nerves, which leads to, you know, everybody knows that term of pinched nerve, uh, which will lead to pain going down the leg or in the neck, going up to the arms. And then contractures will sometimes uh, cause pinching of the nerve. That elbow contracture we see in the picture there can lead to pinching of what's called the ulnar nerve, which will make the hand painful and numb. And then we talked about using walkers being affecting the joints, but will also affect the nerves. Uh, too much pressure on the hands and wrists can lead to the carpal tunnel syndrome, a pinched nerve in the wrist, which can be painful. Next slide, please. Chronic disease is unfortunately very common in people with cerebral palsy. Uh, in this study that we did, uh, we see that the people with cerebral palsy, their, their measures are in blue, and the uh, people without cerebral palsy, their measures are in yellow. Well, cerebral palsy have more of these chronic diseases like diabetes, asthma, hypertension, heart problems, stroke, emphysema, joint pains, and arthritis than people who don't have cerebral palsy. So there's a increased amount of heart disease, kidney disease, respiratory disease, which affects breathing in the lungs, and overall inflammation. Inflammation is when the body is reacting to different things, and that's one of the things that causes most diseases, inflammation in the system. One of the things that causes inflammation is obesity. Too much body fat will lead to inflammation. And these diseases will lead to people being less mobile, which will lead to more obesity, which will lead to more inflammation. So just doubling down on the problems. Next slide, please. Bowel problems are very common in cerebral palsy, as we all know. And bowel problems are one of the main causes of pain in people with cerebral palsy. In some studies done, one third of people living in the community uh, had problems with their bowels. In a study that we did, 52% of the population that we that we looked at had some symptoms of constipation, some symptoms of problems with their bowels. Um, we see in the graph below the picture, uh, the uh, blue uh, the blue parts of the uh, in the graph represent some kind of symptoms affecting the stomach pain or gas or that kind of thing. Uh, we see it was common whether people could walk, whether they walk with with walkers, or whether they use wheelchairs. Uh, problems with the, the stomach, problems with bowels are very common. The uh, diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome tends to be more common in cerebral palsy than other populations, probably because of the bowel problems that they have. 
People with cerebral palsy often struggle with nutrition, which can lead to these problems as well, and then have less movement, as we've described, which can contribute to these problems. Next slide, please. Fatigue, sleep, and depression are more common in cerebral palsy than they are in other populations. People with cerebral palsy have problems with sleep, probably because they have uh, problems with their, with, within the brain and sleep is a brain function. Fatigue is very common. They, they don't get as, people with cerebral palsy don't get as much sleep as other people. It takes more energy to do anything when you have cerebral palsy. So fatigue easily comes. And then people with cerebral palsy have a higher rate of mental health issues like, like depression and anxiety. Well, all of these things make pain worse. They contribute to pain. When people haven't had good sleep, when they're fatigued and when they're depressed, they tend to feel pain and, and, and sense pain more than when they don't. And then in the cycle of how things go, all these problems are made worse when people have pain. Sleep is harder, movement is harder, fatigue comes easier, and uh, pain can cause uh, mental health problems. Next slide, please. One of the more interesting setups for pain that we found comes from all the way from infancy. Many people with cerebral palsy start their life in the neonatal intensive care unit. Babies that are in the needle, neonatal intensive care unit tend to have a lot of pokes, a lot of procedures done. And it's been suggested by many researchers that all those pokes that happen when people are babies can tend to change how they perceive painful, uh, painful events and things that cause pain when they get into their adult years. So things that may not feel painful to other people may feel painful to people with cerebral palsy because their pain thermostat was changed from all the pressures and all the, all the procedures that happened during their early years. Next slide, please. So pain is a, a main predictor of quality of life. As, as everybody here knows, pain is just a part of life in cerebral palsy. And studies show it causes the main difference in quality of life it comes from pain. It lowers quality of life more than anything else. Pain treatment is complex in cerebral palsy. Dr. Gennady is going to be talking about that quite a bit. A greater understanding will, will help develop better treatment. So now the question is, where do we go from here? And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Mary Gennady. Great. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Dr. Ed Herbitz and Jody and Shannon for um, being here today and thank you, Paul, for this great opportunity. So I'm gonna to talk to you about how your abilities might change as you age. And particularly if you remember, Jody said she was wearing many hats. One of those hats is that she is on the advisory board um, for my CP and we have a registry. So we're gonna talk about from the Cerebral Palsy Research Network, some, some results we found on the adult surveys for function and pain. So um, we started a learning health network of hospitals that treat people with cerebral palsy, and we're trying to collect clinical data. But also we knew that it would be really important to find out what people in the community think about um, changes they experience because the more information that we get, especially information that tells people's um, own stories, the more insight we can have. So we're trying to develop a, a registry where we can ask people questions about how their function and pain changes over time. And lots of other um, diagnoses have used this, like Down syndrome and autism, and made incredible gains in putting the research agenda forward by getting voices from people in the community. So we have an internet pre presence from the Several Palsy Research Network, and it's a broad community of clinicians, researchers, providers, and advocates for people that wanna advance the care for individuals with CP. As we know that, um, a lot of the needs of adults with CP are largely unmet by the current knowledge that we have. And so we created this internet presence where if you have cerebral palsy, and even if you don't, and you're just a friend of someone with cerebral palsy, you can enroll in my CP. 
And when you enroll, depending on who you are, you'll be presented with an opportunity to answer questions. And we ask questions about um, information about who you are, what type of CP you have, um, your level of education. And that information is really important when you do research to try and make sure that your findings are applicable to other people with the same characteristics. And then we ask people about how they move, how they use their hands, how they um, communicate. And we ask if there's been an, any changes. In the, uh, for child, we ask for childhood changes in um, physical function, and they will get the last three years for changes in hand and speech function. Then we give some measures that are, you know, just a few questions. And from that, we can get some information on your overall well being and how you feel um, stigma and if that impacts your, your life at all. And then if you have chronic pain. And if you have chronic pain, we have a series of standardized measures that we ask about different um, treatments and your anxiety and depression and where your pain is and how well it's been treated. So we had our first reports published and um, we have done mostly our rec recruitment on social media and talking to people like you who are involved with organizations that are friendly and um, support people with CP and we've had webinars. And our first set of surveys was published um, the data analysis with 264 respondents. Right now we have um, almost 600, but we are usually generally lacking in people that are more severely physically involved. And um, part of that might just be accessibility. And part of that might be the fact that we might not be reaching certain people um, with certain characteristics. But in among those people that have answered, we've seen the general trend is people are declining. And this is gross motor function. And the orange is decline and the yellow is improvement. And it was really exciting and interesting to see that some of the adults have gotten surgery or done exercise programs and felt like they improved. But in general, 60% of the folks had um, reported a decline since childhood. And in the last three years, 27% and 9% reported declines in communication. When we looked at GMFCS level or the ability to walk with, you know, walk without a walker or with a walker, or if you use primarily a wheelchair, we can see those people that walked with a little bit of difficulty, people that use a walker and people that might um, just use a wheelchair and maybe do a little bit of household amb ambulation tended to have the report the most decline. And then when we looked at um, gross motor decline, hand function decline, and communication decline across the age span, there's a definite trend that with increasing age, there's increasing reports of functional decline for, for physical function and hand function. And in communication, the highest frequency of decline was in the age range of 45 to 64. When we asked people why they th thought they declined, as um, Dr. Herbert said, pain is a major contributor to functional decline, as is fatigue. And there's also reports of changes in strength, people getting weaker, and then changes in spasticity and dystonia. And that those are um, fairly large amounts of, of people, 40%, 42%. So those things are quite prevalent and you could click more than one reason for um, functional decline. When we looked at chronic pain, there was 78% of the folks that reported chronic pain. And in some samples of CP, the reports of chronic pain are even higher than that. Um, the average age of onset was 28 years, but the pain intensity did not vary. How much pain people felt didn't vary by your ability, your functional ability level or your age, which is quite interesting. When we look at pain interference, as Dr. Herbert said, primarily interfered with sleep, work, and walking. 
And so these, when we're looking at these um, areas, you can see this bar here is the median. And this is where about 75% of the people fell. And on this five point scale, um, I mean, on this 10 point scale here between five, six and seven, this is pretty moderate pain. And then here we have seven, eight, nine and 10 is pretty intense pain. So people are generally reporting moderate pain. And when we ask people where their pain was, people had an average number of locations of 28, um, average number of locations is eight, eight places hurt. And the range was from uh, 23, up to 23. Low back was number one with 76% of people complaining of low back pain. Unfortunately, when we asked about treatment, most people said it was it was worse than it was um, a year ago. And again, that was only 10% said it was better because 40% said it was the same. So 10% only reported that it was better. And the majority said it was either the same or worse. So the pain is not well treated, even when you're um, looking at in the last 24 hours, 70% said they had la less than half of their pain intensity reduced from their treatments. So we have some ways to go. However, when we ask them what really helped, um, we see physical therapy, over-the-counter medication, massage, exercise, and non-opioid prescription medicine. And what you can see that there was a lot of variability. It wasn't like 50% or 80% said physical therapy or massage or exercise. It was between 20, 15 and 20%. And this is because different types of pain respond to different treatments. And I do wanna to bring to your attention that no one said that opioids it was not, an, it, it did not approach even anywhere near 14 or 15%. Um, opioids don't treat a nociplastic pain, which is a specific pain type. And Dr. Hurwitz has um, done research that he might want to comment on that demonstrates that opioids are not the, the medication of choice for people with um, CP, with chronic pain. And it, not only the side effects, but its efficacy is not very high. So I'm going to talk about some pain types and some pain treatments, because I told you it's not treated well, and it might be related partially to what type of pain that you have. So first of all, we want to differentiate between acute pain and chronic pain. Acute pain is sort of like that normal pain. It's when you bump into something and you get a cut, uh, when you step on something or your finger gets stuck in, in, uh, in the door, it's, it, it's gonna give you um, protection, tell you something's wrong. There's inflammation and repair and it's very reflexive. Chronic pain is abnormal. It's not protective. And your, your chronic pain can be either peripheralized or centralized, okay? And that's usually not very helpful and it's very difficult to treat. Chronic pain is an established disease and chronic pain is the pain that lasts more than three or six to six months. It outlasts the time of healing when there's no longer a noxious stimuli. It's really a persistent pain without a clear cause. It's not protective. And it seems like the intensity and the interference is greater than what you would see, you would expect looking on physical exam. And you really should see a work with an interdisciplinary team, physical therapists, occupational therapists, psychologists, physiatrists, um, uh, neuropsychologist, whoever, usually at pain clinics, if they have them are interdisciplinary, if they're not, if you're not in a pain clinic, make sure that you are seeing multiple professionals and you have someone like a physiatrist to coordinate that care. So we talked about the different types of chronic pain. 
And this is just a little bit of Latin, but this is nociceptive, right? So some sort of noxious stimuli, neuropathic, some sort of pathology of your nerve, and nociceptive. Something is going on with the central nervous system that is making pain. So nociceptive pain is sort of that pain that we talked about that is really inflammation, a mechanical irritation, or an injury. It might be an ankle sprain where there, you know, you rip some of the ligaments. It might be some osteoarthritis where you don't have any cartilage left in your knees or on the behind your kneecap. It might be from some sort of joint deformity from uh, your from rheumatoid arthritis and you have osteoarthritis as a result. Pain also can be caused by damage to the somatosensory system or to the um, actual, the, um, the nerves that innervate the muscles. So you might have, as Dr. Herbert's described, if you're using a walker or crutches a lot or using your arms primarily for your functional mobility, you might end up overstretching um, the areas in your hand and get carpal tunnel syndrome and median nerve gets injured and you have you know these fingers here uh, that are involved the thumb and the first three fingers or you might have some sort of nerve damage from shingles this is you know post herpatic neuralgia and that would damage the axillary nerves and give you some sort of chronic sort of pain you might have a de diabetic neuropathy, or you might have complex regional pain syndrome, where you regionally, the nerves are irritated and have an over response. Or you might have nociopastic pain, no, nociopastic pain, or you might have, as Dr. Herbert says, probably have a combination of all three or one or two of them. Nociopastic pain is when you have the same sort of stimulus, but you get a heightened pain response. So here you might have an equal stimulus of this pressure from the arrow, but what happens with someone with nociceptive pain, the way they perceive it, it's as four big rocks hit their toe when really it was just one rock. And it's because the nerves are oversensitive and you have this response where you, your, your central nervous system is sending stimuli that it's very dangerous stimulation. Now, nociceptive pain can arise after you've had some sort of other pain. Once you experience pain for on and on and on, your body adjusts to it. Your body is plastic. Your nerves and your brain adjust and anything is felt as a threat. And nociceptive pain is seen in, among people with low back pain, among people with knee pain, all right? So you might have some degeneration of your spine and you might also have, so that would be, you know, some sort of osteoarthritis pain, but you might also have nociceptive pain with, around your low back pain. You might have knee arthritis and some of that pain might be nociceptive. You might have carpal tunnel syndrome, which I told you was neuropathic, but it might also develop into nociceptive pain as well. Fibromyalgia is where you just hurt all over your body. And that is a form of nociceptive pain. And some people have jaw problems and that um, easily develops a component of nociceptive pain. So oftentimes we see people with combinations of types of pain and it makes it more difficult to treat. The way that we as clinicians differentiate from the types of pain is partially by clinical examination. So if you can see nociceptive, neuropathic, and nociceptive, we do a clinical examination. 
We evaluate how you respond to treatment in all three of them, right? But then to differentiate neuropathic from nociplastic, we might ask you some specific questions about how your pain feels, or we might have to do some tests where we're putting electricity through your nerves, or we're poking you with a pressure measuring thing to see how much pressure gives you pain. Um, but the questionnaires are pretty good at giving us an idea of where you're at with your pain type. Now, there's different types of treatments for the different types of pain. And there's pharmacological interventions that you can use for neuropathic pain um, and nociplastic pain. But that is something that you would speak to your physiatrist about, okay? Not, and I'm the I'm a physical therapist right here, and I'm sure Dr. Herbis will answer any pharmacological questions you have afterwards. But I'm going to speak to you about physical therapy. Um, we really admonish that you choose PT first when you have pain, because we have a whole host of non-pharmacological interventions that have been shown to be almost effective or as equally effective. Um, as some of the pharmacological interventions. And they include exercise, mindfulness, biophysical agents, weight loss, posture management, and conservation of joints. The thing that's great about exercise is that it targets all types of pain. And it's gonna, it can target um, nociceptive, nociplastic and neuropathic pain. And chronic low back pain, I put this on here because Cochrane is sort of like, you know, they look at all of the information and they tell you these are the treatments that work, that really work. So exercise is one of the best, uh, the best supported ways to treat chronic low back pain. And not only will it reduce intensity, it's also going to reduce um, pain interference. Knee pain is also is also um, responsive to exercise, and just by increasing your heart rate, you can overall reduce your body's ability to perceive pain. Mindfulness targets nociceptive pain. Mindfulness and meditation improves pain and depression symptoms and quality of life. It's not 100% in the Cochrane review, but the first few systematic reviews are out. Mindfulness has a large effect on low back pain, in it, but it's still emerging evidence for knee pain. And mindfulness is the basic human ability to be present to be aware of what we are and what we are doing, not being overwhelmed and not being overreactive. You can practice by being still, having gratitude, concentrating on your breathing, observing the sensations in your body, moving intentionally to concentrate your movement with your breath, and then yoga, chair yoga, it's one of the most adaptable forms of exercise. And I love the focus because it's on um, acceptance and love of your body. NICPAD, which is the National um, Center for Health and Physical Activity for People with Disabilities, has all sorts of videos. And I'm gonna give you guys this PowerPoint so you can go to the links and you can do all kinds of exercise as well as meditation. Biophysical agents include things like hot packs and cold packs, electrical stimulation, dry needling, and massage. They don't have a large, as large of an effect as exercise, but sometimes these things really help, um, just help modulate the pain and help you um, get through really painful days and after painful activities. And they are very useful and can be done at home or under 
with a, with a physical therapist. And what I wanted to alert everybody at this um, webinar about was that maintenance therapy is covered by Medicare. And skilled maintenance therapy, the focus is on to sustain your current function and prevent the slow loss of function. So just because you have CP and you're not gonna get better functionally, if you're at risk for losing function, you can work with your therapist to get Medicare and other third-party payers to pay for skilled maintenance therapy. Now, reducing biomedical, biomechanical stresses by losing weight, working on your posture, using this adaptive equipment, those are all really great ways. I wanted to alert you to NICPAD Connect, where they have the mentor program, which is mindfulness, exercise, nutrition, and resilience. It's an eight-week program. It's free, and they um, love to have people with CP in it. And it's four days a week. And it's, I think it's a one or a two hour commitment. And it's really, really great, really nice community. You can also work with your PT or your equipment vendor or whoever is your favorite person to work with, your physiatrist, your OT, about ways you might work on energy conservation, maybe changing your equipment, maybe using a scooter for some of the times and then walking um, purposefully or swimming instead of walking ways that you can preserve your joints and still stay strong and active. Now we're gonna hear from Jody again about why you should join my CP. Before I do that, Dr. Janai, my friend who doesn't have cerebral palsy, they have a different disability, is currently in that program that you just spoke about. And they like it, they say it's very educational, very helpful and very flexible. You don't have to do it on a rigid schedule. You can kind of do it whatever you want. So I fully support that program you were just um, talking about. And I am appreciative, appreciative of all the information you and Dr. Herbert shared because I didn't even know some of the things. So this is interesting. <laughs> if you want to learn more information like this, you should join my UCP. Um, my UCP is from the Cerebral Palsy Research Network. And the goal of the Cerebral Palsy Research Network is to optimize the lifelong health and wellness of people with cerebral palsy and their families through high quality research, education, community, and programming. There's different parts to my UCP. There's educational, informational, Oops. Sorry. Uh, go go to the, the broad based community. Yes. This? No, no, the community. Go back. Okay. Sorry. This one. Yes. Sorry. Um, there's a lot of different aspects of the website. There's educational um, aspects where you can learn more about mental health, physical health, education employment, adaptive clothing, many different resources. There is also a chance to join a message board community where you can connect with people of different, who have different types of CP from all over the country. Um, and also there's a lot of caregivers on there. So there's a lot of parent support um, and just a lot of information like you learned about today. Uh, Mary, you can go to the Next slide. For the research, and I'll get into the different topics that we talk about in a moment, there is um, children and family research, but there is also a lot about adults with CP and issues that are specifically for people um, 18 years of age and older. I know when I get older, I thought, well, I turn 18, okay, I'm going to be forgotten about. But learning about this, um, the research that's going on with UCP um, and my, my CP.com and the research network has given me hope that, you know, we're not just left behind and people are thinking about us too. 
right now there are over 30 centers doing research and I think we just added two more positive last week. So it's ever growing and there's a variety of different topics that we're researching about, which I'll talk about, I think, on the next slide. Yes, there is clinical research. So um, we're looking at facility management, um, depending on your um, ambiguity, you don't really have to be that mobile. We're trying to encompass everyone. We're also looking at surgical options. We're also looking at shared decision-making. Shared decision-making is where you are actually a part of your treatment or part of your choice of, for your treatment. Your physician, your OT and PT, they don't just say, you have to do this. You actually are a part of like saying, okay, I'm up for this treatment. Okay, I want to do this. It, it helps you have control of your care. We're also looking at nutrition and body consumption, as Mary said, um, obesity. Well, as Dr. Giannotti and Dr. Gerber said, obesity is a contributor to pain. So we're looking at how to help people have a more balanced diet and um, just be more healthy in general. There's also quality improvement. There's transition to adulthood, which I know can be tricky for a lot of people for a variety of different reasons. You no longer have the school as your safety net. You're kind of thrown out in the big world trying to figure everything out. We're trying to be able to help guide and give a path to people on the journey. There's dystonia management, hip surveillance, as Dr. Herbert has discussed. And the quality improvement group that I'm a part of is um, the adult pain and screening and classification. So we're looking at how people um, classify their pain if they think the pain they only have a little bit, somewhat, it affects their um, daily activities all the time. If they don't have pain, it's really fun stuff. Very interesting. The paper's coming out soon, so look for that. Um, there's also educational resources. There's a CP toolkit, like I said. The specific adult Q toolkit is coming out. Um, webinars, forums. We just had one, I think, about um, how genetics play a role in cerebral palsy. There's a very um, interesting webinars that you can join. Like I said, the community is great because you can get information from people, share your story, peer support, make friends. Um, and then there's also educational resources and the mindfulness exercise, nutrition to optimize resilience. Uh, Dr. Giannetti, you can go to the next slide, please. Like I said, you can participate in this lovely community, and it's not only for people with CP or their parents. As you can see, we also have people who are spouses, friends, caregivers. It's a whole variety of people. So it can be whoever's an ally or a person with cerebral palsy. You can go to the next slide. And that's what I was discussing now about the different percentages of the people. And you can always join in and register um, for the website and also to contribute to the research that Dr. Giannetti was talking about with the pain surveys and how pain is being tracked over years of people with cerebral palsy. And why you should take the surveys. You learn more about yourself. It's super interesting. You may think you're just clicking answers things, but when I was taking it, it really made me think like, oh, how do I feel today? Oh, have I been feeling this way? over the past couple of weeks, 
over the past couple of months, or just just the one time thing. Um, you get a score to help you compare to other people with CP to see kind of where you fit in with everyone else. Because I know day to day, it's hard to say, like, am I the only one feeling this way? I have no one to talk to, um, different things of that nature. So this kind of gives you a relative comparison to other people um, and how you fit in to um, the healthiness or your function. And you're also helping people contribute to research. Um, I think Shannon can attest to this. Um, the different research, research studies that we conduct, whether it's just specifically with people uh, with cerebral palsy or other people with disabilities, they are so happy they did this um, after they do any type of research because they're like, yeah, hey, I'm contributing to my community because not, not a lot is known out there about my such and such disability and people just like giving back. Um, like I said, you can also learn more information, like the interesting information Dr. Janati and Dr. Herbert's told you today in the different web webinars. And the community is just awesome. People are on there every day posting about their lives and um, what they do for different treatments or um, just, you know, having a social outlet so you don't think that you're alone in the situation because I know it can be isolating sometimes. And here's the website for uh, the research network and my CP, the community as a whole. And then we have questions. And I know we have two questions already, and I think they're both directed towards Dr. Hermits. Um, I don't know who wants to. Let's do see that. if I can see if I can see them. Okay. okay. The first That's question tough. is. Um, should I go ahead and address the questions? Yes. Yes. The first question is is and, and anybody can chime in, of course. Have you noticed differences in CP for those that identify as transgender individuals? I would say uh, no. I have I have never seen anything different about that. Um, it, uh, it, it you know in terms of of uh, my treatment plans for people, uh, the orientation doesn't uh, really affect anything. Of course, there's some you know varied psychosocial issues that that uh, need to come into play, which affect certain aspects of of their life which would you know be something we would have to take into account but uh not not really in terms of of uh, how it uh, physically affects their serial palsy or how they or their functional changes uh dr Shnani, anything about transgender individuals and patients that you the, see the only thing is is transgender individuals are uh, as a population are really at risk for misdiagnosis and lack of access to healthcare anyways. So, um, and, and so are people with CP. So just really making sure keeping yourself educated, having to advocate, finding providers that are allies um, is really important because it's sort of like, um, you know, coming from a racial minority group and having a disability, it's sort of like a double barrel shotgun, right? Doubled stigma. Uh -huh. Okay, the next question is, uh, talked about cervical dystonia was diagnosed in 2015 but was treated with Botox in the last years and it stopped to change a doctor. What can we do when doctors will not treat us? Well, um, that's that's a complicated question and uh, I, I think that um, that the uh, best answer that I can give you is advocacy, self-advocacy um, and um, I think that uh, there, there may be an idea to think about uh, reaching out to an advocacy organization to help you to work that through with your, your doctor. Uh, there may be resources in the hospital, uh, like in the social workers and this kind of thing, which may 
uh, and then even even there's some hospitals have uh, you know patient advocate organizations among themselves to help patients work through issues with uh, with doctors. Generally speaking, when anybody comes into a doctor's office, the doctor, the hospital, the cell system behind it wants that person to leave satisfied with the medical care that they received. So there's there's often ways to uh, you know, there may be resources in the hospital or just having good heart to heart with the doctor and doing some self advocacy maybe providing the doctor some literature uh, could be helpful. And if that's not helpful, then uh, it may be worth asking the doctor or and I, even without asking the doctor about getting a, another opinion, getting a second opinion. So, um, and again, uh, Dr. Sani, anything you'd like to say about what happens? No, I, I would just say work? change doctors, but that's probably, that's not always possible. You're the consumer, you know, um, but, and, and then the other thought was, is I don't know enough about the cervical dystonia. I would imagine that not treating it with Botox would cause more pain, but you would also want to figure out if there's a reason why it was contraindicated why maybe the doctor didn't do it. Maybe there was something else going on. I don't know enough about your history, but um, those would be, there's, a, you know, usually you're entitled to a second opinion um, if that's possible. That's, yeah. that's, I do exactly what Dr. Herbert said, get an advocate, yeah. but I, I have, um, I have kids with special needs and I constantly am firing and hiring doctors. <laughs> um, I, you know, there's a concept we talk about now and I, I hope, and they're teaching in a medical school, I found out, and it's called shared decision making. Yeah. And either either you need to, you know, convince, explain to that doctor why it needs to be done, or he he or she needs to tell you uh, why it shouldn't be done. Like uh, Dr. Nye just said, you know, is there a reason their doctor is not doing it that they haven't told you? That that would be an important question. The next question is, are cramps in the feet and migraines common in adult stroke palsy? And the simple answer is yes. Uh, I see a number of patients with migraines. Sometimes the migraines are actually also treated with botulinum toxin. That's not a procedure that I do, but I, I do know other people who do that. And uh, cramps in the feet can be because of spasticity or it can be because of certain medical conditions. It can be because of I, you know, I, I want to say overuse, even though you may not feel like you're overusing your feet. But but again, since since uh, I've been told by adults with stroke palsy that that anything they do is three to five times harder than anything that a person with stroke palsy does, it could be just walking the the distance that you, most people in your workplace or home life or that kind of thing need to walk is just putting a lot of stress on the feet and causing the cramping. Um, the, uh, the next question is, uh, can you see it, Dr. Zanotti? Yeah, about, uh, it's, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. regarding maintenance physical therapy, have you had success with coverage from private insurance like Blue Cross, Blue Shield, or Medicaid? So um, personally, I am a physical therapist and I work at a, the University of Hartford and everything I do is pro bono. So I don't have personal experience. Other therapists that I know of have had success with private insurance and public insurance for maintenance therapy. And I told Paul that I was gonna send the fact sheet along with the PDF of these slides to everybody who was in the, he was gonna send them to him, he'll send them in the webinar. Because oftentimes you need to educate your therapist about how to advocate and how to actually write the goals and the assessment. But yes, you should, even if you have private insurance, you should be able to get covered. Even though CP is not a neurodegenerative disease, there's enough evidence to show that there's risk factors for decline. And if okay. I could just chime in here real quick, um, I know from other people, not necessarily my situation, but others, even if you have to go to the appeals process, um, I know it's a pain to even think about dealing with that with insurance or with the state, but usually if you go in and tell them your story and they actually see you as a person and not a number, um, it's very helpful. I know it can be stressful, but but people need to advocate for what they need and um, have access to what they need. So I would also appeal if you 
um, if that's something you would think would be helpful. Okay, our next question is, is it detrimental uh, to be on muscle relaxers uh, long term? Well, the first thing I would tell you is, is that I have patients who are on muscle relaxers long term, been muscle relaxers for 20 years, 30 years, but medications like baclofen. Um, it's important to uh, understand what the medication uh, can do for you and to you. So very often uh, when I get a new patient in my clinic who is an adult with cerebral palsy, let's say 35 years old, and they've been on baclofen for more than 20 years, um, I will talk to them about slowly, slowly, slowly decreasing the baclofen so that we can see if that has a good effect or a bad effect. The bad effect would be that the spasticity increases and the person has more trouble moving, more pain, that kind of thing, then we put the baclofen back where it was. The good effect might be that the person is more alert, uh, you know, it finds it easier to do their work, uh, has, finds it easier in their relationships because they're not as uh, sedated as some of the medications can, uh, can cause. Um, so it's always good to experiment with that to see if it's a certain point in your life where the medication is helping or not, because people do change as they, as they age. Uh, even from childhood into young adulthood and young adulthood into middle age, there's ch changes occur all the time. Medications can cause other effects in the body. Baclofen can cause inflammation of the liver. So uh, if you're on baclofen a long time, you should never assume that because you did have uh, back inflammation of the liver the first five or 10 years that you won't get it. And that needs to be checked uh, on, on a you know regular basis, uh, anywhere from you know every three months to once a year, depending on the dosage and depending on uh, your doctor's experience with it. So um, there are pluses and there's there's minuses. Uh, certainly, if they're they're helping function, um, then it's can be a good idea. And if they're impairing function, it's time to you know, back down on them and see what else can be done. I want to mention, though, that some people have uh, muscle relaxers that are pumped into their body, the intrathecal baclofen pump, and it's very likely that that, that will not have as negative long-term effects uh, or liver inflammation as the pills do. Um, that's something that needs still to be seen. We have about 25 years experience with the pump, um, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll need to know that, but uh, that's a little bit different if you're getting it by pump. Um, oh, okay, uh, uh, Duncan, I see your question is, information is often addressed by the media. Inf infl inflammation, inflammation, inflammation is often addressed by the media. What is the value or downside of over-the-counter medications? Well, the uh, value of over-the-counter medications is that uh, they're, they're cheaper if you don't have insurance. If you do have insurance, sometimes it's cheaper to get them uh, by prescription. Um, they're, um, they're, they often have less side effects because they've been approved by the FDA to be sold over the counter without a doctor's supervision. And so that can mean they have less side effects. It does not mean that they're completely safe. Uh, if you take over-the-counter aspirin or Motrin, for example, you should always take it with food. Uh, it can cause ulceration of the in, inside of you, inside your GI system, just the same as, as prescription medications can. Um, the the uh, downside, of course, is what I just said about people think that since it's over the counter, it's just safe, and it's just it's not. It's still you have to read the directions and you have to take the dosage that that says it says they do. I've had people, you know, they, they, they really had a lot of pain. So they took three extra strength aspirins, uh, uh, extra strength Tylenols. That's way too many. They've taken six Motrins. That's way, way, way too many. You're going to burn your stomach out. So that's the downside. But if you take them according to directions, uh, you take them the uh, Motrin, the uh, Aleve, the ibuprofen with food, um, then over-the-counter medications can really have the advantage that they're available, available to you anytime that you uh, want them. And, and they work, they can uh, reduce pain. Um, there's a question about uh, trans individuals often use, often use surgery in their transition. Is there any concerns or different risk for trans folks in surgery? I have a client with CP that is a chair user. Um, you know, I, 
I have not had the experience of having someone uh, who's actually transitioned that way uh, and has serial palsy. So I, I'm going to have to defer. Um, I, uh, I I just don't know. You know, if we think about uh, having deferred, I'm going to say a few things. Um, <laughs> I, I, when you think about hormonal changes, uh, I'm sure that can have an effect on spasticity and so forth. Um, surgery, any kind of surgery will have a temporary effect on spasticity until some of the symptoms are relieved. Um, but the actual uh, going through uh, the transition uh, of genders, I, I do not I do not know uh, how that will affect uh, other aspects of serial policy. And I invite anybody else to make a comment if they wish. No comment. No. It's a good okay. study, Dr. Herbert. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it would have to be a very large population though to get you know enough patients to to do something but it'd be maybe it would be interesting to perhaps it'd be something done uh, qualitatively by interviewing a a, a group of, of folks who've had that experience be interesting to know yeah anybody that has surgery that doesn't move well is at risk for pneumonia that's the only thing i can think of you know yeah there's a couple of comments. Uh, we we advised uh, Marguerite about uh, changing doctors, and she said she did change doctors, and and still having the problems. So we need to change doctors again, and maybe look at some of the other things we talked about. There's a another comment by Marguerite that says medications can be harmful and long term side effects to organs over years. Um, what can be done? Well, uh, as I mentioned, take a medication holiday. Uh, see if, and again, a lot of these medications, you have to come off them very slowly to have negative side effects uh, and do that with the doctor, under a doctor's care, but see if that medication is actually helping you, see if the dosage can be lower. I've sometimes taken people that, need, that benefit from staying their back within, but they've been on, you know, 60 milligrams three times a day. I brought them down to 30 milligrams three times a day with the same beneficial effects. Uh, those are the, some of the things you need to do. And then, of course, monitoring to see if there is any any uh, organ damage and uh, through the blood work and, and sometimes ultrasound and then switching medications and you still need the spasticity relief. Um, is it impossible to differentiate between worsening CP symptoms with aging or a stroke? Uh, if I have a baseline CT, can someone take a look at that? Well, the, the, uh, the, the answer is this is not impossible. It's not impossible if, uh, you know, for example, there are findings on CTs and MRIs that suggest a new stroke. Um, and then, of course, comparisons can be helpful, but many people get an MRI when they're five, and if they have a stroke when they're 45, you really can't compare anything. But there are there are ways that uh, neurologists can look at the, uh, neuroradiologists can look at the uh, changes in tissue in the MRI and they can see if it's something that happened uh, happened more uh, recently. So, um, and, and you know, the, the other thing is, is that uh, if the change is sudden, if somebody has difficulty moving the right side and then one morning wakes up and can't move the right side, that would not be CP worsening. CP worsening would be a, a uh, a gradual, a gradual process. And by the way, we we don't like to talk about the idea of serial palsy worsening. It's just serial palsy its effect on the aging body um, can make some of these problems worse. But serial palsy itself doesn't necessarily get worse. Um, I, and I was going to say, I think Marguerite was talking about walking a lot and doing cycling and dancing. Lifestyle is you know, 60% of everybody's problem. So if you're worried about the side effects of the drugs and you're having a healthy lifestyle of drinking water and exercising and eating good foods, that's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Hysterectomy concerns, just as we talked about before, that any kind of surgery can affect the body, cause more spasticity, uh, that, that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, no different than I mean, every surgery is different, but, uh, um, you know, uh, it, it, that, not that I know of, of any different other surgeries. Um, uh, hysterectomy can uh, sometimes also be associated with uh, hormonal changes, depending on how the procedure is done and how, what's taken out. Uh, it can cause early menopause. Uh, menopause um, is a body change that affects things like 
increases the risk of, uh, of fractures as we saw in, a, in uh, it, it can increase the risk of fractures as I talked about uh, in females, the uh, fracture line starts to go up after that age, after menopause. Um, uh, Dr. Shinani, any other concerns? The history. No, I mean, just, uh, you know, um, I, I'm just going to always put a plug in for physical therapy. I mean, if you have a surgery and your mobility changes, you know, like with the hysterectomy, if your ability to get in and out of bed changes because you have to put a lot of pressure on your arms and that's contraindicated by the doctor, then getting physical therapy and getting the right type of help to make sure that you can keep moving is always important after surgery to prevent any kind of lung problems or other secondary complications. So be, you know, just being a big advocate for yourself is making sure you have the supports that you need. You might need PT after a hysterectomy. Um, I don't take baclofen. Do other muscle relaxers have the same effect? Uh, generally, the answer to that is yes. Um, every muscle, every medication has slightly different effects, but uh, I use other medications like uh, tizanidine, which is uh, also called Xanaflex, uh, Neurontin, which is also called uh, Gabapentin, um, and uh, uh, sometimes we use Valium uh, for, for uh, uh, tone reduction. So yes, uh, other questions, uh, other medications can have uh, similar effects. And um, it's good to talk to your physician about uh, which, uh, which medication is best for you with your other medical history. And just um, another plug for exercise. Um, I saw there was a question there about Botox damaging the muscles. And sometimes some of the things we do to reduce the spasticity um, will actually, might actually damage the muscle. And I'm going to give you a counterintuitive sort of um, thought is if you try specifically strengthening those muscles that are spastic, you might see a change in your ability to function um, because but your muscles are very, very plastic. They respond to resistance training. And if you can move anyway and work with someone to help you train them, it, it might help reduce your spastic, your parent ability to move through your spasticity and your pain. And um, I've seen great success with that with um, folks. Okay, we have Margaret has a hand up as well. Um, Margaret, did you have a question behind this? I don't know. Uh, she says, yes, I do. Okay. Is she able to unmute and speak? Thank you, Paul. Um, my question is, what can we do to help other people with seeking to become more active? Because there's to get them involved in what I do because it helped me it helped me to To stay strong in in his 
We get older. I found out that as we get older, our muscles don't work as well when we were younger. I'm done. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Marguerite. Um, so, Marguerite, I'm, I'm, I believe what I heard in your question was about, uh, you know, what can you do to stay healthy and feel young, uh, and and just, just you know, keep yourself more mobile. Is is that yeah. what you were asking? I think so. Yeah. 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 And then so, a lot of people don't want to get out, can't get out of the house. Yeah. I, I heard, and and as you get older, it gets harder to get out of the house. The house yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and I was, I, I would direct you to Nick pad. Um, you know, the mentor program is great. Um, there is exercise twice a week, nutrition and mindfulness. So there's four times a week and that's at home at your own schedule. As Jody said, Nick pad also has a whole bunch of videos. There's so many exercises that you can do at home. I talked to you about chair yoga. It is hard. I will say I've done telehealth with people with several palsy and for some people, they need to have a helper there to do the telehealth exercises or even to do the exercise videos. And you could build that in as part of your personal care attendant routine. Or another idea is that there, you might have some sort of respite services if you have a care, if you need caregivers. And you can sometimes use those monies to pay for someone to bring you to the gym. But I think everybody needs to do something, figure out how what they can do at home. And the Nick Pad has so many great different things. Uh, what would you say, Jody? I would say the same thing. And depending if you get, oh, what is that called? Um, community living supports through the state of Michigan, they do allow for an OT and a PT to come to um, if you get those funds. But even if you don't get those funds, I would say, just me as a person, I'm not talking about anyone else, but I would be a person that would need someone to help me. But I would want to do the videos in any way I could Granted that if I did it the same as like how it's shown on the screen, but I think just um, being able to do what you can, um, whenever you can, whether it's like I'm moving my arms right now because I'm speaking, but to me, that's exercise because I'm getting <laughs> my arms to move. So I think a lot of people think, oh, I need to do like a specific treatment to be able to do this because personally in my opinion my whole life was physical therapy okay do this that and the other but i think if you can just if you're having a good day because i know days which for people some days you have a good day some days you don't but on those good days if you could just increment inc incrementally move just a little bit more or just like be conscious of your movements to me too that's very helpful like oh i got up a little bit more today oh i did this i grabbed my own glass today so like giving yourself the little wins also helps as well so it doesn't have to be so formal and like rigid but that's just my opinion so i, I want to say one more thing about this and that is that um my cp is uh the website that jody was talking about is a wonderful forum for a community discussion yeah and you know you heard what what dr johnny had to say you heard what jody had to say 
if you want to hear what a lot of other people think about it, maybe people that have exactly the same issue, mm -hmm. MyCP is a great place to go. Tell the world about yourself and, and uh, you, you get some answers and responses, uh, more ideas. And people get back to you really quick. You don't know that emails come in and out and in and out every day. So it's not like your question will be stuck or not answered. Someone will get to it eventually. Yeah. yeah, and I, if you want to yeah. contribute more to our our understanding about how to treat pain and what happens to people when they age, please do the surveys. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I they really make you think. Mm -hmm. I know what happens. Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I know we all going there, but I want to. Do you want to take the full questions? Or what is your schedule like? Um, well, I'm, I'm booked out to 1.30. How about uh, the rest of us? I'm booked till 1.30. Yeah, so we can do okay, a couple more. Let's do it. OK. What happens if you hyperextend the muscle when stretching? Then the muscle doesn't want to, the muscle doesn't want to hold me up. Um, yeah, um, so I'm I'm going to say that uh, the muscle needs treatment. Um, you should see your physical therapist or your physician. And I don't know, uh, uh, Dr. Schneider, if you want to say anything else about that. Yeah, I would see I would see a physiatrist probably that would probably do maybe be able to do a test and then send you to a physical therapist because that doesn't sound um, that doesn't sound that sounds like it needs treatment for sure. Yeah. Marguerite says, as we get older, we need to get more active. Uh, and Nancy says, uh, for our information, sometimes Blue Cross has an exercise rebate. Okay. And Marguerite was asking for the website. Uh, yep. You know, I, we can send it, but the uh, just it's mycp. If you do mycp, mycp.org, mycp.org, um, they will get you there. Mm -hmm. And we'll send you the PowerPoint. Um, in PDF, so you could uh, get to the websites as well, if that's helpful. Um, for the exercise ones and for my CP and the surveys. I want to thank all of you. Thank you very, very much. I really learned a lot myself. The only, I guess the one question I have is we talked a lot about the physical part. I know a lot of people with um, swelling issues or, or um, breathing with a trach. It's very hard to exercise. Is there a correlation? with cerebral palsy and diesophagus and trach. So is the question, the questions about physical therapy for the esophagus and the trach? Yeah. Um, so those smooth muscles aren't under um, voluntary control, but that is not an area of expertise for me. Um, that would be more speech and occupational therapy. So I would, I would, I would um, guess I would punt that over to Dr. Hervitz. Um, I, I and I give the same, same answer. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if a way to improve that for the esophagus, the speech and language pathologist to oral motor strengthening, uh, to 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 help the muscles around the mouth and 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 so forth, but. Beyond that, um, I, I don't know of any anything that they do. I know they also do some electrical stimulation sometimes that, that's supposed to be helpful. It's called Vitasim. Uh, it's up in the air whether that's helpful. We're still looking at that. Yeah. And for the breathing, um, you know, if someone needs to be on a ventilator, I mean, there are there are exercises that physical therapists do with breathing training, but it's not going to get you off the ventilator. It's going to optimize you while you're on the ventilator. Um, and those are those are people that are at the most risk that need some sort of a movement program. Everybody needs to move somehow. 
Um, and it's really challenging and really difficult sometimes for, you know, I know that pe- some of the people that, that we work with, it takes about three or four of us to do some of their movement programs. And that's why we need access in the community and support systems. And that's what we're hoping that these surveys will do, will show the overwhelming need um, for the treatment of pain, their overwhelming need for uh, functional decline, and the need for support systems and maintenance maintenance therapy um, to support a population that's at risk. That's the whole point of what we're doing. Well, as they are on this CP seminar, we'll talk about dysphagia, where Sarah Warshaw from the U of M, and that will be April 26th. It's a Friday at 12 o'clock, and I will be putting together a flyer and it will be the same format. Sounds great. Thank you for having us today. Well, thank, thank you, you so all. much. Thank you, yes. everyone. Thank you. Great questions. Right. Excellent have a great questions. Day. Have a wonderful right. day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.